Chili is flavor. Chili is yeah. fun. Chili is exciting. Chili is versatile. Uh, chili is an aphrodisiac. <laughs> this is second nature. As soon as you're born, I mean, in your baby, you're eating hot sauce. Chili is better than. Uh, it could be better than sex. <laughs> it was so incredibly hot. I mean, I would have drank ditch water if I could have found it. I felt like I didn't have any teeth. You really want to taste hot chili because it's like jumping out of an airplane. The excitement you get from doing that, that's the excitement you'll get from tasting a good hot chili. And you become addicted to it. And you start getting into it. And you start really liking it. So it's once you become a chili head, you really become a chili head. Yeah, I'm a chili addict. Yes. Oh, convince me you're I'm, I'm good. There are times that I go through withdrawal. If I go through more than a week without chilies, I'm very sad, I'm very depressed, I'm very boring. But with chili, it gives drama to my life. It gives uh, effervescence and uh, excitement. Good stuff. What's with these people? It sounds like they're part of some drug cult. But actually, they're just enthusiastic about their favorite food, chili peppers. Hi, I'm Dave DeWitt, here in historic Santa Fe, New Mexico, and your host for Heat Up Your Life, the definitive documentary that explores the weird, wonderful relationship between human beings and the hot and wild. You see, people have been infatuated with chili peppers for thousands of years, and this strange but powerful entanglement has changed the course of human history. And as you'll see, this madness still continues today. So prepare your palate and get ready to heat up your life. In the interest of people, peppers, and passion, we dedicate this next hour to heat up your life. And now, episode one, Peppers and People, how hot and spicy has changed our world. Every year since 1988, the National Fiery Foods Show is held in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's a show that proves beyond any doubt that people all over the world have gone berserk over chili peppers and hot and spicy foods. About 12,000 chili heads, those avid fanatics of hot and spicy, visit more than 260 booths at the Albuquerque Convention Center. But what exactly are these bizarre connoisseurs looking for? This is, this is a, a convocation of, of pepperheads like happens nowhere else on the planet that I know. And there's free samples. Need some pickled chilies? How about some habanero pecan brittle? Y'all like to try some? It's really good or green chili pistachios. Like to try some raw garlic cloves with red chili? Or the crazy insanity sauce. With me is a gentleman named Dave Hirschkopf, and he's in a straight jacket. And why on earth would you wear a straight jacket to the Fiery Food Show? Oh, because we make insanity sauce. Oh, what is insanity sauce exactly? Well, it's what we claim to be the hottest sauce in the universe and is the only sauce ever banned from this show. I know, because I banned the sauce That's from this right, show, at least did. the tasting of it. <laughs> so you were the pioneer in developing the super hot sauce category uh, in Fiery Foods. Uh, tell us how you came up with the idea, and, and then tell us uh, why. Well, I used to own a restaurant in Maryland, and we got a lot of drunks in the restaurant. So I used hot sauces to just get the drunks out. Why would people um, consume these super hot sauces? You know, after all these years, I'm still not sure, but, you know, there's the macho appeal, how hot can you eat it? There's the, the drug appeal of it, sort of an, an endorphin and kephalin sort of rush. Um, and there's just sort of some people like to just do something strange. And one of the stranger things that chili heads do is collect as many bottles of hot sauce as they can. Behind my friend Chip Hearn here is about 50 different hot sauces, which represents about one one hundredth of his entire hot sauce collection. Tell us, Chip, about your sauce collection. We try to have as many different sauces as we can at any time to taste and to sell and to collect, but I have 5,500 different sauces in the collection. How did you collect these sauces? Started out just by our travels. We travel a lot, not as much as you, but we travel a lot and bring back hot sauces to the collection. We still do a lot of traveling through South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, but now it's become a concept where people are sending us sauces. And where is this collection housed? Dewey Beach, Delaware. We have a restaurant called the Starboard Restaurant in Dewey Beach, and we have all the sauces lined up behind plexiglass in the restaurant itself, in the dining rooms. That's to prevent people from walking off with the sauces, right? Yes. <laughs> 
The obsession with hot and spicy products is not just limited to the United States. At the Fiery Food Show, manufacturers show up from all over the world, including Panama, where habanero sauces such as Congo sauce are very popular. Interestingly, an identically named sauce showed up from Trinidad and Tobago. Indian products such as curry sauces are represented by the colorful Chef Shake. Taste it and enjoy it. Asia was well represented at the show, with exhibitors coming all the way from China. Back home in China, uh, the mass of the people believe that the, this kind of pepper sauce uh, really, really increased your appetite, you know. And also, they believe that this can uh, help you to uh, reduce body fat uh, because it increases the, the blood circulation and uh, that give you the more energy. And uh, the other things, I don't know whether I should say it or not, they even claim and they believe that they somehow increase the, uh, the sexual activity. Even the region of Tibet is represented at the show. Each of our sauces are infused with Tibetan herbal wisdom and uh, what we say is our trademark slogan is liberate your senses and that's what it does. Our latest sauce is called the Tibetan Dead Hot Sauce and it comes with a Tibetan Book of the Dead and it retails for about $10. One thing you'll learn from the Fiery Food Show is that everyone has very strong opinions about their products. We won first place last year at Best Pepper Sauce at show and we were going to win again and we are going to be another Tabasco sauce. Trinidad pepper sauce is going to be all over the world. It's in Saudi Arabia right now. It's going to England. It's going to Japan. It's going everywhere. And we one day are going to be very, very wealthy with this product because it is the finest pepper sauce in the world, made with the habanero pepper. And that's what makes it so unique. Besides the thyme, the basil, ginger, garlic, sweet pepper, onion, celery, and the habanero pepper again. And what conclusions are reached at the Fiery Foods Show? You get the opportunity to be, to be part of a cult. I mean, you're, it's like a, a following. You know, there's people that like... Uh, all, all sorts of things, but this is a safe cult. You don't, you don't kill anybody, you don't, except yourself. <laughs> eating chili is better than eating nearly anything else there is to eat. It almost makes you want to sing. Eat me in the morning, eat me in the evening, eat me at supper time. Eat me on eggs, potatoes, meat, or snacks. You can eat me anytime. To know me is to eat me. The all-natural food that bites back. <laughs> what? Or perhaps a better question is, who's responsible for all this chili madness? To answer that question, we're going to have to take a journey far back in time. It was here on this tiny Caribbean island of San Salvador, where most historians agree things really started moving. But that was even earlier than when this island drummer's slave ancestors first came to the Bahamas. For tens of thousands of years, chili peppers were exclusively a new world crop, separated from the people of Europe and Asia by the vast, uncharted expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. But shortly after the year 1492, events began to heat up all over the globe. After landing in the New World, Christopher Columbus encountered two of the most important foods the world has ever known, corn and, of course, chili, which he promptly misnamed as pepper. Columbus took the offering back to his ship, and within a century, the major cuisines of the world would be changed forever. Records do not show whether Columbus and crew sampled the pungent peppers on their long voyage back to Spain. But chilies were one of many New World plants laid at the feet of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella upon the explorer's return. After 1493, West Indies chili seeds were made available to the Spanish, where they were carefully grown in monastery gardens. Monks and amateur gardeners cultivated the plants and later provided seed to other collectors in Europe. It was soon apparent how this hot culinary upstart would be accepted by the rest of the continent. Peter Martyr, a cleric in the Spanish court at Barcelona, wrote, It is called caribe, meaning sharp and strong, and when it is used, there is no need of black pepper. Chili peppers quickly spread throughout Europe as the seeds made their way across the Mediterranean Sea and moved eastward from Spain. 
Portuguese explorers carried chili peppers and their seeds from the Iberian Peninsula to ports in North Africa and West Africa. Additionally, Portuguese trade from their colonization of Brazil introduced South American varieties directly into Africa. Carried by trading ships, the Portuguese introduced chilies into their colony of Mozambique. The chilies were spread into the interior of Africa by farmers and by birds. From Africa, the Portuguese carried the chilies to their colony in Goa, India, and curries would never be the same. The Portuguese also were involved in the spice trade, so their ships added a new spice to the Spice Islands as chilies were spread to what is now Malaysia and Indonesia. Once in Asia, chilies quickly spread to Southeast Asia, China, and the Philippines. Once in the Philippines, Spanish traders carried the seeds across the Pacific on their way to their colony of Mexico. And in this manner, chilies were established on Pacific islands such as Hawaii. Within a hundred years of their discovery by Columbus, chilies had circumnavigated the globe. And what was the legacy of Columbus? Chile botanist, Dr. Hardy Eshbaugh. If we take a look at uh, chili peppers or capsicum on a global basis, what we find is this now has become the primary hot spice everywhere in the world, although all peppers originally came from the New World. And everything we see in the Old World has occurred since 1492. Uh, it is a dominant crop in many parts of the world, Thailand, India, Tanzania and Africa, in some of the Pacific Islands, and uh, it has shaped and changed dietary approaches of these people. Although we don't think of the food of the Middle East as being particularly fiery, chilies abound in the markets, like this one in Asalt, Jordan. India has become the world's largest producer of chili peppers, and the demand for chilies to feed its huge population has created gigantic markets devoted solely to chilies, like this one in Guntur, the chili capital of India. And we cannot imagine the cuisines of Southeast Asia without the pungency of chili peppers, which are grown in every country and are commonly available, like in this floating market outside of Bangkok, Thailand. Meanwhile, in Mexico and the rest of Latin America, chilies were often more than just a food. We spoke with chili expert Dr. Janet Long Solis in Mexico City. Another use of chili peppers was as a defensive weapon. And uh, a burning fire of dried chili peppers is really a very accurate smell. And uh, they would use it in small villages to prevent attacks from enemies. Peppers also had medicinal uses mostly to uh, treat infections, throat infections, teeth infections, cough, and um, pain. It was also used as a pain reliever. To understand the early medicinal uses of chilies, we consulted a curandera, or healer. In the chili fields of Lemitar, New Mexico, Maclovia Zamora picks the fresh green chilies for use in traditional herbal medicine. Zamora sells the chili and other medicinal herbs in the historic B. Rupi drugstore in downtown Albuquerque. Oh my heavens, we're in the back room of the Rupi drugstore. Look at all these old drugs and chemicals and everything. Uh, McClovia, how long has this been here? The turn of the century. We started with herbs and then we went to medicines that are bottled and encapsulated, and now we're reverting back to the herbs. A natural progression, I'd say. And, and look at the chilies. My heavens, you've got uh, New Mexico. wonderful. Yes, New Mexico red chilies and some habaneros and some uh, chili pequins. So you use this room to dry the herbs and chilies, yes, I assume. Yes, we do, because it's cool and it's dark. You almost have a museum back here. Yes, we would like to do that, turn it into a museum one of these days. But in the day-to-day -day operation of B. Rupi Drugstore, the role of chilies is paramount in herbal medicine. They are used as a catalyst for everything. You can add chili to everything that you are taking. That would be food, it would be remedies of some kind, any remedy. You have your, your uh, choke cherry uh, cough medicines, and you can add chili to that. 
You can add chilies to eucalyptus. That's also cough medicine. Chilies can be used for poultices. It can be used for salves and liniments. This is why you get a burning sensation whenever you apply a liniment. How would you mix something up to, to use chilies to relieve, say, arthritis pain? For arthritis pain, okay. Now, long ago, they used to use lard a lot from your chicharrones. They'd make chicharrones. They would save the lard. That lard was used for salves with chili. They would use, in order to make it a little firm, they would use the beeswax, and uh, that's called um, campeche. They use cayennes for colds, and they use it like maybe in a chili sauce, maybe in a form of cough syrup. They can use it in a cough drop form. They can make cough drops out of those, uh, like you would make hard candy, but you would add the chili to it. You can use it for um, headaches. It opens up your, your sinuses, and it drains off all that uh, mucus that drains into your lungs and into your chest area and causes inflammation. So it is a very, very good source for uh, controlling colds. Thank you very much. The Rupee Drugstore also sells all the modern remedies containing chili peppers, but the curanderos will tell you that the herbal concoctions work just as well and are much less expensive. And some people believe that chilies also have supernatural powers. There was a case that came in here one time, and uh, it happened to be a man that owned a business, a filling station, and he was feeling the presence of very negative things happening, and he wanted to bring in some very positive things. So then uh, we were telling him that he should take maybe a container made out of um, micaceous clay or something like that and build a fire with a cross similar to this that has been blessed. And to take chilies or chili powder and set that on there and then burn these items until they're absolutely turn into ashes. And to go around the place with this and just cleanse the whole area around the uh, filling station or his business that he had and to do it at midnight, always at midnight, full moon if possible. When all the items in the container finish burning and turn into ash, then you must take these items and throw them in the river so that they can flow away with the current and all the negativity flows away with it. My ears are tingling and... But sometimes the extreme heat of some chili peppers has a negative aspect, as this college student is learning the hard way. It takes a, a lot to make me sweat, but this is making me sweat. <sighs> oh, my hands are numb, everything. <sighs> I feel like I'm gonna... At New Mexico Tech in the town of Socorro, Dr. Frank Etzcorn, the inventor of the nicotine patch, is cheerfully torturing his students to determine if chilies release natural narcotics in our bodies called endorphins. We'll have two groups of subjects. We'll put... Uh powdered habanero pepper, about a fourth of a gram or a little bit less on each one of, uh, of their tongues. And um, then we'll have them uh, rate the pain as it increases, as it invariably will. And at that point, we're suspecting that the body is probably releasing endorphins to try to help attenuate that pain. Then when, uh, when the subject uh, maintains that the pain has, has, has diminished, We'll inject them with the uh, narcotic antagonist, Narcan, and uh, we'll, we will hope to see some of the pain return. If we block the uh, attenuating properties using the antagonist, the pain should return. And uh, that's basically the study right there. It truly is a chili high. I mean, <laughs> you experience one every time you eat a really hot pepper or too hot for your tolerance. And uh, I experienced it. it. It was like figures were more defined and my head was really light and I really didn't have too much pain after that and I really needed to sit down because I was just relaxed. Not relaxed but in a type of euphoria I guess, euphoric state and I think I hit the chili high. Well the pain involved 
with chili comes from more than likely capsaicin. It's a, it's a very potent drug. It's a neurotoxin, uh, certainly not uh, neurotoxic levels at uh, what we consume in our food products. But um, capsaicin certainly produces pain. It works with a neurotransmitter called substance P. It works with a neurotransmitter called uh, serotonin. And uh, those two neurotransmitters are intimately related to uh, another neurotransmitter called the endorphins. Uh, there are a wide variety of those things, and uh, we know that they're about a thousand times more potent than morphine itself. Dr. Etzkorn proved that chilies release pain-killing, drug-like endorphins. But scientists have also found that capsaicin interferes with the transmission of pain signals to the brain by depleting the neurotransmitter substance P. This has led to pain-killing topical creams for the treatment of arthritis and other pain. But in addition to medicine, modern science has other interests in chili peppers. This is Guatemala, a small Central American country. It has its share of environmental problems typical of other developing nations around the world. One of the more severe difficulties is the continuing loss of native habitat because of slash and burn agricultural practices that result in the loss of plant and animal species. After burning, the land is planted for crops, but the soil eventually wears out and can no longer support agriculture. What remains is a land devastated and virtually devoid of life. Certainly not a place where you would expect to find wild chili peppers. But try telling that to Dr. Paul Boslin, the intrepid professor of horticulture at New Mexico State University. The foremost chili pepper breeder in the world, Boslin traveled to the jungles of Guatemala in search of treasure, invaluable plant genetic material. About 55 years ago, Paul Stanley from the Field Museum of Chicago toured Guatemala looking for some of the wild species types, and he found two specific species in the localities, and he took very excellent records of where he found them, at what altitudes, and the kinds of ecological zones he found them in. And so what we'd like to do is go back to those zones and see if they exist. And the reason is that they don't exist in anyone's germplasm collection or gene banks in the world. Are they, are they still existing or have they gone extinct? They're excellent species in the sense that they're adapted to damp, wet forests is what his notes say. So when a, when a pepper would have adapted to this damp, wet forest, it carries many genes that would be useful to pepper workers. One of the unfortunate aspects of these wild species is that they are weeds. They have no economic value, commercial value for local people to use. And in a sense, they try to eradicate it. And that's what we, we come up against when we look for wild species, is that they either have to be in areas where there's very little human activity or where there is some other use that we don't really know about. And maybe medicine is one of the things that we would hope with the wild species of capsicum, maybe some of the people are saving it because of its medicinal purposes. And there are other reasons for wild capsicum preservation. Two species, Lanceolatum and Ciliatum, just may provide a cure for fungal diseases, such as Phytophthora root rot, that plagues commercial growers back in the States. Boslin is eager to find moisture-tolerant species such as these as he presses on. Armed with Stanley's notes, good maps, and local guides, he set out on an expedition to find them. His search takes him through virtually every type of habitat in Guatemala as he follows Stanley's trail. On a hunch, Boslin decides to search local village markets near Stanley's old trail. He's betting that someone may be harvesting wild chilies, much like they do in Sonora, Mexico. 
He finds many different varieties of chilies, including semi-wild Pekins, fresh Cayennes, and even the fresh Canario chilies, the pubescent species with their unique black seeds. But what was the result of his search for the wild species? Well, it's been a very uh, disappointing trip in a sense for me, not being able to find these species. It appears that they are probably truly extinct in those regions since they grow in a very narrow belt or region, only about from 1,000 meters to 2,000 meters in those localities. And in that, in that uh, area, it's intense farming now. So the likelihood of finding those species is, is slight or, or, or non-existent. What it means to us is that these species are extinct, their use, their valuable genetic resource is gone forever. Uh, doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't bring the species back. And so it's a loss, not only for us, but for future generations. But the Guatemala story doesn't end here. Boslin left the camera crew for one more attempt to find the wild species. A few years later, we spoke to him in his greenhouse at New Mexico State University. So, Paul, you uh, took off from the tape crew and sort of went on your own to try to find Lancio Latum, I guess, and uh, apparently you did. Yeah, most of the places that were had been reported in the past is extinct. We couldn't find it. But there's a preserve in Guatemala set aside for the Quetzal bird. That's our national bird, isn't it? Yes, it is. And so in, in that preserve were a couple of populations of this, this wild plant that looked like uh, Capsicum Lancio Latum growing there and, you know, bringing it home and looking at closer examination of it. It was. So were you able to get seed from this lanceolatum? Yes, we've been able to, to get a very nice seed increase, and we'll be putting this into the USDA germplasm collection so other researchers can use this plant in their studies. You know, the wild plant here really has no use for a grower or gardener at this point, but in the future, who knows what genes this thing uh, may have for us. What about the outlook for the extinction of the species? It's very uh, high, I guess you could say. It's extreme. Um, Capsicum likes to grow where uh, lots of people like to live and where other crops grow, and so it appears that it's becoming extinct. A lot of the species are, uh, the one on the Galapagos Islands can no longer be found. We had a difficult time finding this one. Uh, one of the species rare that nobody even has a living uh, source of in, in Peru is not known anymore. So it, it, it's very dangerous. They like to grow in, in the rainforest, and, and as we all know, the rainforests are being depleted quite rapidly. Well, if the birds eat the pods and pass through the seeds, how come this plant won't establish itself from the Quetzal Preserve into the rest of Central America? Excellent question, because uh, it appears that the Quetzal is very, very sensitive to human encroachment. And so anytime humans encroach into their territory, they leave, they move to a new area. Oh, they don't come back to with, with the farming areas and so forth. Exactly. And so all wild chilies are, do have a bird uh, association. We don't know if the Quetzal and the Lanceolatum have that association, but there is some bird that is dispersing the seed. And it appears that it moves with the, as the forest is being cut down and never comes back. But not all wild chilies have fared as badly as the ones in Guatemala. The goal of preserving at least one wild chili species, the Arizona chiltepine, has been accomplished thanks to the efforts of Native Seeds Search, a Tucson organization devoted to conservation and seed saving. We spoke with chili expert Kevin Dahl at the chiltepine reserve near Tumacacari. In every little canyon around here, different populations of these wild chilies have different genetic characteristics. Some of them may have developed characteristics that will be important as a tool to breed healthier, stronger, more resistant commercial chilies. They might be uh, resistant to certain diseases, funguses, pests, um, and provide a palette of uh, genetic material that plant breeders can work with. This is the wild chiltepine plant here in the wild chili reserve. We're preserving it in site. Now, of course, we've also collected seeds and have it in our seed bank and their frozen high-tech storage. But preserving the population intact where it's been growing for centuries gives us um, both a better protection that it will be preserved, but also a lot more information about how it interacts with the plants and animals around it. In the Sierra Madre Mountains of the Mexican state of Sonora, south of the reserve, wild chiltepines are one of the few crops in the world that are harvested in the wild. After drying, they are imported into the United States and are packaged in one quarter ounce bags selling for more than one dollar making them the second most costly spice in the world after saffron. Sadly, because of economic pressures and cattle ranching, they are endangered in Mexico. 
this wild chili reserve is just one small step in what needs to be done to preserve genetic diversity. Uh, there are groups and organizations um, working to come up with an international strategy to preserve the most important areas right away. The wild chili peppers first appeared hundreds of thousands of years ago in the Americas. Dr. Janet Long Solis explains. Botanists tell us that uh, the family of chilies had its origin in South America, and uh, you, more or less in the Andean area. And there are, there are a wide variety of peppers, but there are only five domesticated species, and between 20 and 30 wild or spontaneous species. There are many uh, remains of chili peppers in archaeological sites in Mexico. One of the oldest is in southern Mexico, between 7,000 and 5,000 years before Christ. So it's a very old plant. Some uh, archaeologists believe it to be one of the first plants that was domesticated in Mesoamerica. But how were they domesticated? Botanists speculate that chilies were first treated as tolerated weeds that were harvested in the wild near villages. It was basic human nature to select the best and largest pods for eventual planting. Dr. Eschbach theorizes about how this might have happened in the past and continuing even today. I've looked at the fruit, the change in fruit size over the last 10 years, and there's a clear indication that selection is leading to an increase in fruit size. There's another one in Bolivia that the people have been using for years and years, and it's commercially harvested, put in bottles, sold that way. And if you do careful statistical analyses of fruit size change, which is a characteristic of domestication, you can see the fruit size where they're selecting this is increasing. So we're watching domestication before our eyes. Today, there are five domesticated species of chili peppers with dozens of pod types and literally thousands of varieties. Obviously, we can't cover every variety here, but we can give an overview of the peppers that people around the world love the most. The most common species grown around the world is Capsicum annuum, which was domesticated in Mexico. It includes the familiar varieties like the non-pungent but colorful bell peppers, like this Quadrato bell. Jalapenos, famous for their use in salsas and nachos. Asian chilies used in stir-fry dishes, such as this Thai hot. The new Mexican chilies, including the enormous big gems that are stuffed for chilies rellenos. The ornamental chilies, such as the colorful New Mex Riot, with its multicolored pods that can be used in the yard as a border plant and then convert it into a hot sauce. Capsicum frutescens, domesticated in Central America, includes a number of wild species and also the familiar Tabasco chili of hot sauce fame. One of the most common species in South America is Capsicum baccatum, known in Spanish as ají. This is probably the most familiar of the ajis, called ají amarillo. Other important baccatums include ají limón, with its lemony flavor. And the ivory-colored ají blanco, which can be used as an ornamental. The most unusual species is Capsicum pubescens, another South American species. It was probably the earliest domesticated species since its wild ancestor has never been discovered. It occurs in South America as this red rocoto, and in Mexico and Central America as the yellow canario or canary pepper. The two distinguishing characteristics of the pubescent species are its beautiful purple flowers and its seeds. It is the only chili pepper in the world with black seeds. Last, but certainly not least, is Capsicum chinensi, the species that includes the world's hottest chili peppers that were domesticated in the Amazon basin of South America. Commonly, they are known as habaneros, like these familiar orange habaneros from the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. But actually, there are hundreds of varieties in South America and the Caribbean, like this ripening red Congo pepper from Trinidad. And the internationally famous Scotch bonnet chili, which we filmed on location growing in a kitchen garden in Jamaica. The Scotch bonnets are used to make hot sauce like this one. How important are hot sauces around the world? To find out, we traveled to the hot sauce capital of the world, New Orleans, and met with Arthur Humphreys, owner of a hot sauce shop in the French Quarter. We ship all the way to Switzerland. Wow. Yeah, 
had to the Soviet Union. Sometimes we shipped some hot sauce to the Soviet Union. Some Louisianians that had moved to the to the uh, U, uh, to the Soviet Union, and they uh, they don't have that over there, and they can't eat that food without it, and they need a supply, and they'll call up for a case of it. Keep our phones ringing off the hook for it. I'll tell you that. What would happen if people just couldn't get any hot sauce? If you took our hot sauce away from us here, we'd really get in trouble. <laughs> really get in trouble. You just thought something that was not true. Oh, you couldn't. But you got a lot of people that know how to fix their own, that can really prepare their own hot sauce. If you did, they would, uh, you'd have a lot of brewers in the backyard with people brewing hot sauce, <laughs> trying to make their own. And uh, a lot of people out here are very qualified. And they really know, because it comes from generation after generation, from their uh, ancestors knowing how to do hot sauce. And, and, and they're passing out recipes from here, you know, from different uh, generations. And a lot of these people know how to prepare their own hot sauce. Fortunately, with more than 10,000 different hot sauces manufactured around the globe, they aren't going to disappear anytime soon. Our planet is still safe. Our jellies are four dollars. But with peppers and people, you need to understand that it's a world of extremes, like huge crowds of fanatic chili heads, the hottest sauce, the biggest collection of sauces, and the world's largest enchilada. We took a journey to Enchilada Land, also known as Las Cruces, New Mexico, for the whole enchilada fiesta, where the organizers construct the world's biggest stacked enchilada. We asked the enchilada maestro, Robert Estrada, just how big his enchilada is. Well, it was last year, uh, it was 10 feet, 8 inches in diameter. And how many people does that serve? Uh, we serve uh, 4,800. Making a tortilla that gigantic takes specialized equipment that was designed by Estrada, including a hydraulic tortilla press constructed out of a tow truck. Here the workers spray the press so the masa dough won't stick to its surface. Estrada explains the procedure. First thing we do, we press first tortilla. The masa weighs 250 pounds. Press the first tortilla. And then after we press it, we carry it into the, the frying pan and uh, we fry it. We have uh, 27 burners underneath. Propane is what we use. And then after we fry it, we pull it out, we take it into, uh, on top of a serving plate. And then uh, I ladle the red chili sauce. We use 75 gallons of red chili sauce. and uh, spread the cheese and uh, onions. And then we go back and we press the second tortilla and we do the same thing, we fry it. And after it's fried, we pull it out. And then we come and we have to lay it on top of the first tortilla, which is a lot of work. And then I do the same thing. I, I go again, I lay the red chili, and then uh, spread the cheese and the onions. And then we go back to the third one, and we press the third tortilla, and then we fry it. And we come over here, and we lay it on top of the second tortilla. And then I ladle the red chili and then spread the uh, cheese and the onions. 
and then uh, we're done. After that, we cut it, and then we, we serve it to the people. Uh, that's the way we, we make that enchilada. It's a lot of work. And how much does it cost to make an enchilada nearly 11 feet in diameter? About $10,000, a little over $10,000. I donated all that to the community. And what is the future of the world's largest enchilada? Well, I would like to uh, make it bigger, you know. I would like to go like 25 feet in diameter, you know, uh, one of these days. I don't know when, but uh, I would like to do that before I uh, am done making the enchilada. You know? <laughs> Pepper is fortifying and makes you sweat on a hot day so you can drink more. It's beautiful. Chili is exotic. So what you have here is an untapped resource of people who, who will go to any length to get hot products. And as long as they keep wanting them, I'm going to try and come up with new ones. Uh, I'll have dattle pepper toothpaste if they want it. Chili will conquer the world, yes, indeed. And from America across the Atlantic, instead of coming the other way around, yes. If you remember summer day when it's going to be really bright and you wake up just as the sun is rising and it comes up and suddenly the light bursts through and you hear the birds singing, there's light everywhere and you see nature around you. That's a, that's a bite of a good pepper. Hot sauce is so important to the people in Louisiana. It's like, you know, like water, you know, you need it. <laughs> you just can't do without it. Chili is the essence of life as far as I'm concerned. Be it with con carne or be it with con queso or whatever, it's just... I don't know, it's just kind of a spirit. What makes people alive? <laughs> and now you know why these people are called chili heads. I hope you've enjoyed Peppers and People, the first episode of Heat Up Your Life. I'm Dave DeWitt saying adios from sunny Santa Fe, New Mexico. And remember, once you start eating chili peppers and hot and spicy foods, you'll change your diet and your life forever.